Hello, I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Tyson Douglas, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. Mike Tyson made his first trip to Tokyo in March 1988 for a rapid destruction of former titleist Tony Tubbs. By the time of Tyson's next Pacific Crossing, two years later, his life had become an earthquake, an unrelenting series of seismic tabloid shocks, and the specter of the big one loomed closer than anyone on this bad planet could possibly have imagined. In February of 1990, 23-year-old Mike Tyson was about to enter the ring for the 38th time in his professional career. The fight was taking place in Tokyo, Japan, and his opponent, as usual, was paid little heed. This was just another demonstration of Tyson at the peak of his powers. The culmination of a career that began with a ferocious and memorable debut in the mid-1980s. Well, a lot of Tyson's early opponents were, were terrified because of his record and his manner and the way he just came roaring out of the corner and was throwing punches nonstop. He was being fed a lot of stiffs and just reeling off these one-round knockouts. He was doing it so spectacularly and so routinely that uh, you could hardly help but get enthusiastic about this. They're always drawn to the big punch. The big punch is something out of the primordial ooze that we cannot deny. Now, I've seen Tyson hit guys and just remove them from the consciousness of the earth. In 1986, Tyson, at age 20, became the youngest heavyweight champion in history. And we have a new era in boxing. He wasn't just winning fights, and he wasn't just knocking out everybody. I mean, he was knocking them out of the first round, and it looked like this was his destiny. By the end of 1989, Tyson had muscled his way to the top of the heavyweight ranks, and the only legitimate challenger left was Evander Holyfield. Their meeting was much anticipated, but slow in the making. So Tyson signed up for a quick payday against an undistinguished opponent, James Buster Douglas from Columbus, Ohio. A tall fighter with a generous reach, 29-year-old Douglas had shown flashes of a potential which had thus far gone unfulfilled. In 1990, Buster Douglas was just another heavyweight out there who looked like a sitting duck for Mike Tyson. Buster Douglas was one of the great underachievers of his time. He always was sort of perceived as a guy who really liked to fight. You know, he had a lot of tremendous physical talent. The big debate was, is anybody going to go to Tokyo to cover the fight? The only important stage that Buster Douglas had ever been on before this fight was against Tony Tucker, a good fighter. And he was beating Tony Tucker until he ran out of gas. That was interpreted as this guy doesn't have heart, will, spirit, need, whatever it was. Only one betting parlor would put up odds on the fight and that was probably just as a gag. They say it was 42 to 1, it was a thousand to 1 or a million to 1. No one gave us a prayer. If Tyson had the odds in his favor, the one thing Douglas could claim was a boxing pedigree, thanks to his father, William Dynamite Douglas, who fought professionally from 1967 to 1980. Bill was an aggressive fighter. He'd throw body shots a lot like Mike Tyson, and he uh, had a left-right combo that'd take your head off. He had a heavy bag in his basement. He would work all day at a hard job, go home, hit this heavy bag, and train himself. My father took me to the gym when I was 10. He was a center leader at the local gym here. I was on him about, you know, wanting to come in and box. Bill coached James, and uh, he was probably harder on James than any one of his boxers because he wanted James to have all the opportunities that he never got in a professional race. Bill was a nice man, but he was a no-nonsense guy. Buster sort of took after his mother, was just a sweet, kind, nice lady. A lot of times, James would want to play basketball in the gym, and Mrs. Douglas would come and get him out the gym and get him back into the boxing room so that he can continue his training. She wanted her son to be even better than her husband. Buster Douglas! After Douglas turned pro in 1981, in spite of his inconsistencies, he did go farther than his father had as a boxer. And in signing to fight Tyson, Douglas would have a chance, however far-fetched, to win the world title. But 
such as 23 days before the bout, everything changed when Buster's mother, Lula Pearl, died of a stroke at age 47. I called James and I said, let's cancel the fight. And he said, no. I was more determined. I told him, I said, I'm all right. And I think that even helped the intensity even more. He told me that she would want him to go on. He was very close to his mom. Before she had passed, she came to his house and uh, she was real worried about him fighting Mike Tyson because she had heard what an animal he was. And he goes, no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm gonna beat him. She had went and told one of her girlfriends, oh, Buster's gonna beat Mike Tyson, you know? So that really gave him confidence too. She was having her battles, but yet she was still looking out for her baby. I mean, that's, that's uh, love, you know? Soon after his mother's death, Buster resumed training, keeping his grief private until one moment after a workout, a few days before the fight. And he had his head down with a towel over his head. And um, I picked the towel up, and he was just sobbing. <laughs> just broke down, and it was because of his mom, you know. That was the first time that I had saw that, and I thought, oh, he just told me to miss his mom. In February of 1990, the boxing press, Mike Tyson, and a grieving but focused Buster Douglas traveled to Tokyo. The story of his mother's death had been communicated to us, but we didn't know at that moment that it had somehow galvanized him. He was, for this one big occasion, going to be the fighter of his dreams. We covered that fight almost as an afterthought, and we got there late in the week, and Tyson was sort of off limits or, or jetting around, I don't know which. Uh, at that point, uh, the only person available was Douglas, because who wanted to talk to Douglas? Fear was a lot of Tyson's weaponry in the past when he was at his greatness. The fighters came in almost frozen, almost the prey of a cobra. But Buster Douglas, by his mother just dying, he had no fear. What, what do I care? That just happened to be the perfect timing that he had to fight a dissipating Tyson whose mind is going everywhere. I mean, a lot of it's following Robin Gibbons' retreating figure. While Tyson seemed indestructible going into the fight, his personal life had been full of turmoil. His brief marriage to actress Robin Givens ended in divorce in 1988, amid allegations that Tyson had beaten her and that he was manic depressive. He was regarded as being in a morbid frame of mind because of his difficulties with Robin and the breakup of that relationship. And, you know, let's face it, Mike was known to be an unusual personality anyway. By late 1988, Tyson's behavior had become increasingly bizarre. Boxing champion Mike Tyson allegedly went on another emotional rampage. Tyson lost control of his BMW and it's Mike Tyson was found guilty yesterday of fondling the... The champ's troubles continue to multiply. At the same time, Tyson was taking apart his old management team and bringing in the new, led by controversial promoter Don King. Gone were manager Bill Caton and longtime trainer Kevin Rooney. Replacing Rooney was Aaron Snowell, who soon found out that he had an uncooperative fighter on his hands. He no longer wanted me to run with him. He didn't want him to be bothered. He said, if they come and get me to run, I'm leaving up out of here. And that was his attitude. In a workout in Tokyo, Mike was sparring with Greg Page, and he got hit and went down. He looked at me when he went down. I said, get up. And uh, he got up and came over like this, and I wiped his gloves off, and I told him to go back in there. I had sat down one night, and I talked to Mike. I told him, you're not Superman. And the best that I know about this game, the things you've been doing and how you've been doing it, you're headed for a butt whooping. Hey, Korakuen Stadium in Tokyo, Japan, as HBO Sports presents World Championship Boxing. This was a fight that took place at about 9 o'clock in the morning in Japan so that it could be broadcast to New York. And it was the weirdest feeling I've ever had in a fight because the people were totally, I wouldn't say unenthusiastic, but they were so polite. It was the dullest crowd I've ever seen. I've never seen anything like it. 
I always say that in the Tokyo Dome, you could hear a rat piss on cotton. That's how quiet it was. When I went over into the dressing room to check Tyson's gloves, he was walking like an animal in there, storming back and forth, back and forth, looking at me like he wanted to kill me, you know. So Mike Tyson was ready to fight. And uh, when I left the room, I told him, I said, you know, you're going to get your ass kicked. But I got out of there real quick when I told him that. <laughs> when Douglas trotted into the ring, there was almost a sense of amusement. We thought he was going to his doom, but he didn't. Mike Tyson rushing toward the ring, wanting to get it on and get it over with. When he got into the ring, I could see that he wasn't, he wasn't in top shape. And plus I had heard, someone said he wasn't really doing any training and he was, you know, having a good time over there. And you can have a good time in Japan. But Douglas was in good shape. I remember that. James Buster Douglas. I noticed he was looking at me, trying to get the eye contact, do his usual stare down and stuff. But, you know, I was like paying him no attention, trying to show no fear. Douglas insists that he's going to shock the world in this fight. I don't know what Mike was thinking. If he knew he wasn't in shape, he should have went out there and threw everything he had in the first round because he wasn't throwing any punches. And Douglas was. After the first round, I felt that Mike was going to have a problem. Very hard right hand by Douglas inside. The way Mike started out, you could see his timing and his rhythm wasn't there. I was sitting next to Don King, and Mike was getting beaten so badly. And after three or four rounds, I looked at Don King. I said, Don, is this really happening? And he said, what's going on? He said, I don't know, but I don't like it. Oh, you're too flat-footed in there. All right. OK? Trust Get that in what you know. Do it. Let it go. Incredibly, the self-proclaimed baddest man on the planet was struggling in the ring. His problems were just beginning. By the end of the fourth round, swelling had developed over Tyson's left eye, and his corner was shockingly unprepared to help him. They had neglected to bring a standard piece of equipment called an end swell, an ice-cold steel press used to reduce the swelling around the eyes of a battered fighter. The disbelief didn't really set in until Mike's eye swelled and we began to watch what was going on in the corner. And, and suddenly it became clear they didn't have a cut man, they didn't have any equipment. Well, the rule of thumb for swelling is put a cold compress on it. I made a cold compress in a rubber glove from down on the floor. They were trying to put icy water into a, a latex glove to hold against his eye, which is like the little boy with his thumb in the dike. I did what I had to do for that time for a mistake somebody made that was on the team. And being that I'm the leader of the team, I take responsibility. But it wasn't his eye being swollen. It was him making a mistake and getting hit with the punch. Whatever went wrong is because of me, you know what I mean? And that's what I keep my, you know what I mean? Because when it goes right, I always say it's because of me it went right. And regardless if you had the best quarterman in the world, if you can't fight, it's useless. If they'd had an end swell, it wouldn't have changed the outcome of the fight, you know what I mean? But it would have made them look a little better. This is high drama, and the crowd here is greeting it by and large with stony silence. And one of the things that was happening at ringside was you noticed the silence of the crowd. It was like they had gone to a movie and Godzilla was coming to eat up the town and then, you know, Godzilla never showed up. Finally, in round eight, Tyson found the opening he had been waiting for when Douglas, emboldened in his role of giant slayer, dropped his guard for just an instant. Buster started looking at his work. Yeah, you ain't so bad. So he posed in front of him, Mike hit him with that uppercut. Boom, down he goes. And there's a right hand uppercut and down they pounded his fist on the canvas. I said, oh, okay, he's all right. Checked my watch to see where we were at in the, in the round. Knew the round was almost over. I said, okay, we're, we're cool. Fortunately, I was just, you know, caught with a glancing blow to where it really didn't do an effect to me. It knocked me down, but that was it. When Mike hit him and knocked him down, I, it was like my kid getting knocked down. And at that instant, I wanted to reach through the TV and help him up. And he got up, and he got up like a man. He got up and he shook it off. And the rest is history. Let's see what Mike can do to finish. And the bell ends to save Buster Douglas at the end of round eight. He had put so much into that shot and to pull it off that it was gone. Mike normally would just swarm all over a guy when he had him hurt. And he just didn't have it in him. And Mike has slowed down. Maybe a tiny bit arm weary. He hits the guy with his best Sunday punch, and the guy gets up, 
He's like, oh, if that don't take, you know, the desire out of you, nothing will. Douglas coming back with a lucky right. Hurt. Tyson is wobbling. Douglas wailing away. Tyson, who had absorbed tremendous punishment, was unable to summon the energy to capitalize on the knockdown. Douglas came back strongly in the ninth round and sensed that Tyson was a spent force in the tenth. The fight of Douglas's dreams was now the fight of his life. Round ten. I started popping him with them jabs, and he wasn't moving as much as he was before. Then I pivoted, you know, I got leverage and came up with it, you know, a real good uppercut. Bow. Oh, the uppercut. And I swear, if Mike Tyson's neck wasn't so big, it ripped his head off. When he hit him, I actually went like that. I swear to God, I did. I went like that. I thought maybe he knocked his head off. He hit him so hard with that uppercut. And then he'd just come with combinations and just drilled him. He fell right in our corner. I said, you're done. Stay down, Mike. I said, oh, shit. That's what went to my mind. What an uppercut by Douglas. And down goes Tyson. And I'm thinking crazy. I'm saying they won't allow me to fight if I don't have the mouthpiece in my mouth. So I'm, I'm grabbing for the mouthpiece. That was over. I tried to get up, and I mostly I was hazy. I didn't know where I was at. He's, he, it's over. It's over. Mike Tyson has been knocked out. At the end of the fight, he asked me what had happened, and I said, "You got knocked out." He wasn't feeling too good. His eye was swollen shut. He wanted to break down and cry, but he held himself together. Where he took his butt whooping like a man. And do. in the history of heavyweight championship fights. Buster beat him at his best. And that myth about him not being in shape, that's not true. Because if he wouldn't have been in shape, he'd have been out of there in about the second or third round because Buster was humming him. He just got his butt handed to him, and that's the excuse that he tried to use. Why did it happen, James? Because I wanted it. Why? Why did you win this fight that nobody on the planet gave you? his mother. In what way? God bless her heart. People around him were saying, let's go, let's get out of here. You want to go, James? No, let him talk. No, let him talk. But that was his moment, and he, he wanted to speak. And I remember myself very clearly saying, let's just follow him as he's dealing with these extraordinarily human emotions. I'm just feeling real good and uh, finally able to exhale with all the things that have been going on and I had to keep inside. But the main thing I wanted to do was express my joy for my father and my mom, but my father. And Dad, this one is for you. I love you. He's my hero. To take the baton, so to speak, and then just to fulfill a dream, not only for myself but for him, was just the most rewarding thing in the world. But in boxing, nothing is ever as simple as it seems. While the world had witnessed a stunning upset victory, Don King would brazenly claim that the real winner was Tyson. I said, I told you, Don, I told you we were going to kick his butt. And he said, get away from me, I'm protesting. I said, protesting what? King claimed that when Tyson knocked Douglas down in the eighth round, the count went long and should have been ruled a knockout in favor of Tyson. The tradition holds that the defeated champion keeps his belts. In the chaos following the fight, Russell snagged one of Tyson's belts figuring that in the event of a protest, possession is nine-tenths of the law. They were all looking for the belt. <laughs> I gave it to Buster when we got back. I said that they could protest it, but they can't take the belt because we got the belt. And then it starts with the, you know, accusations, well, they might not let you be the champion. You might have to relinquish the belt and fight again for the belt. You know, it's like, well, you might have won the fight, but you're not going to enjoy being champion. Word came that there was going to be a meeting back at the scene of the crime. You didn't know what was up, but you knew it wasn't going to be good for Buster Douglas. It was one of the most contentious press conferences I've ever seen. The door banged open and they walked to the side, and the image in my mind was, now you know what it feels like to be working at a 7-Eleven at 4 in the morning when they come in to rob you. And there's nothing that you can do. Here they come. Don King, perhaps because he wasn't in America, was behaving with 
amazing impunity and bravado. I mean, he just assumed that he could overturn this decision, this, this knockout, um, with no problem at all. And for a while, it looked like he would. Everybody has seen the facts, and the facts are irrefutable and incontrovertible. First knockout totally obliterated the second knockout, you know, claiming that Douglas had been knocked out. Well, Douglas hadn't been knocked out. The guy said nine, he got up. This is boxing baloney. This is not true. King went to the videotape, questioning the accuracy of referee Octavio Mehron's count. But according to boxing rules, the ref in the ring is the ultimate authority. And even if the count as executed by Mehron was slow, it was final. More important, Douglas was on his feet at nine and ready to fight. Silenced by the public's vocal support for the new champ, King abandoned his quest to take back the title. When he came home, it was like nothing I'd ever seen before. The pride that the city had, there was so much excitement, and uh, it was amazing how many people admitted they were on the bandwagon. We knew you were going to do it, Buster. And the news was just rocking with James Buster Douglas from Columbus, Ohio. He was like a king in this, this community because he represented someone getting to the top. We went to the parade and we went downtown City Hall and they had this big stage set up and as far as you could see there were people. It was like hanging around with Michael Jackson, the Beatles, Elvis Presley. I always told him, I said, you're like Elvis Presley. Hanging around with you is like being with Elvis. Everybody wanted a piece of him, you know, because he was the guy that beat the baddest man on the planet. I was embraced, you know. That was cool, a nice reception when I came back. But that was a lot of demands. You know, I got to do the talk shows. That was all right, but I'd much rather have been just at home, just chilling. Later that year, an overweight and underprepared Douglas was quickly knocked out by Evander Holyfield, losing his title, but gaining a $24 million payday in the process. Douglas retired to Florida, where he grew to the dangerously unhealthy weight of nearly 400 pounds and almost died in a diabetic coma. Forced to get fit again just to stay alive, Douglas staged a comeback, winning eight of his nine bouts before retiring for good in 1999. I always wanted to do something in a good light to where it showed that I existed in this world. You know, it all came together for me. As for Tyson, after losing to Douglas, things would only get worse. He fought just four more times before being sent to prison in March of 1992 for the rape of a beauty queen. And after being released three years later on parole, he returned to the ring a caricature of what he once was. Between ear bitings and angry outbursts, Tyson continued to make headlines. But the aura of invincibility was gone. Looking back now, the Tyson-Douglas fight is really the beginning of the end for Mike Tyson because Douglas exposed him as a guy that can be beaten if you're not afraid of him. Just keep chopping on him, just keep chopping on him. And eventually he's gonna go. And that's what happened, as you've seen over there, he was flat on his ass. <laughs> the blueprint that existed for how to fight Mike Tyson was executed by Buster Douglas. Nobody knew that he was capable of it. The ring was his refuge. And once he lost that image of being a monster destroyer, of being untouchable, then he had to face something closer to real life, and that's a, a very, very difficult prospect for him. Mike Tyson will be okay. He'll be all right. Regardless of what people would like to see happen to me, like people say, oh, he just wanted to like the rest of the fighters. Not a, I doubt that seriously. And that's why I guess people are upset, because they really wish that would happen. He was like one of those guys just there to flare briefly and uh, now that that's dimmed I think it's going to be a long journey out. Douglas turned out to be just as badly programmed for success in 1990 as was Tyson. Evander Holyfield immediately knocked Douglas out but another six years would pass before Tyson and Holyfield finally met and by that time Iron Mike had lived several more damaging lifetimes outside the ring. Through all the upheaval, Tyson remained the sport's most famous and infamous figure and its biggest box office draw. Thanks for watching The Tale of Tyson Douglas.
consciousness of the earth. In 1986, Tyson at age 20 became the youngest heavyweight champion in history. And we have a new era in boxing. He wasn't just winning fights, and he wasn't just knocking out everybody. I mean, he was knocking them out of the first round, and it looked like this was his destiny. By the end of 1989, Tyson had muscled his way to the top of the heavyweight ranks, and the only legitimate challenger left was Evander Holyfield. Their meeting was much anticipated, but slow in the making. So Tyson signed up for a quick payday against an undistinguished opponent, James. Right hand by Tyson, right to the head, and it's all over. Oh, wow. wow. Well, a lot of Tyson's early opponents were, were terrified because of his record and his manner, and the way he just came roaring out of the corner and was throwing punches nonstop. He was being fed a lot of stiffs and just reeling off these one-round knockouts. He was doing it so spectacularly and so routinely that uh, you could hardly help but get enthusiastic about this. They're always drawn to the big punch. The big punch is something out of the primordial ooze that we cannot deny. Now, I've seen Tyson hit guys and just... Seismic tabloid shocks. And the specter of the big one loomed closer than anyone on this bad planet could possibly have imagined. In February of 1990, 23-year-old Mike Tyson was about to enter the ring for the 38th time in his professional career. The fight was taking place in Tokyo, Japan, and his opponent, as usual, was paid little heed. This was just another demonstration of Tyson at the peak of his powers. The culmination of a career that began with a ferocious and memorable debut in the mid-1980s. I'm Jim Lampley. Welcome to this look back at the stories behind Tyson Douglas, one of the most memorable fights in 30 years of boxing on HBO. Mike Tyson made his first trip to Tokyo in March 1988 for a rapid destruction of former titleist Tony Tubbs. By the time of Tyson's next Pacific Crossing, two years later, his life had become an earthquake, an unrelenting series of signs. Buster Douglas from Columbus, Ohio, a tall fighter with a generous reach. 29-year-old Douglas had shown flashes of a potential, which had thus far gone unfulfilled. In 1990, Buster Douglas was just another heavyweight out there who looked like a sitting duck for Mike Tyson. Buster Douglas was one of the great underachievers of his time. He always was sort of perceived as a guy who really liked to fight. You know, he had a lot of tremendous physical talent. The big debate was, is anybody going to go to Tokyo to cover the fight? The only important stage that Buster Douglas had ever been on before this fight was against Tony Tucker, a good fighter. 